Hi there, everyone. My name is Scott Nicholson, and thanks for having me here at your conference. I'm coming to you live, well, at least live my time, from uh, uh, North America, specifically from Brantford, Ontario, in Canada, where I have just joined the faculty as a professor. I left Syracuse University this year and have started working for Wilfrid Laurier University at their Brantford campus, where I am a professor and a director of the new game design development program, as well as running the, uh, the Brantford Games Network, Game Lab. And I'm continuing to focus my research on games in the physical world and specifically on escape rooms. Uh, my own work is focusing now on two paths, how to use escape rooms for educational needs and then how to better create corporate training environments for escape room facilities. So this is my current areas of research. Uh, but for those of you that uh, might have seen in January of this year, I did a study of 175 escape room facilities and put that out on the web. Now, today what I'm going to be talking about are three things. I'm going to be talking about the state of escape rooms in North America, and I'll be giving you some of the results from my study that uh, talk about specifically ways North American escape rooms are, are, appear to be different than escape rooms from around the world. I'm going to talk about a couple of different projects in North America that have caught my eye, and then I will talk about a project that I did and how you could use that as inspiration for designing better escape rooms. So, let's get started. Now, in North America, escape rooms are working their way over. They are not as advanced as they are in Asia or in Europe, um, and there tend to be a couple places where they're huge. Um, you know, New York and, and Los Angeles, as you might expect, have some facilities. This chart you see here is from escaperoomhub.com, and so the number are the number of different facilities that are in these markets. And so Los Angeles and New York have quite a few, um, and there's a little hub in Colorado, but the big hub in North America is actually in Toronto. And in fact, in Toronto, at the end of 2013, there was just one escape room facility. At the end of 2014, in Ontario, there were over 50. And this chart shows that, actually. So this is from escapistto.wordpress.com. Every dot you see here is an escape room facility. So each one of these facilities will have three to five different escape rooms. And so, as you can see, the, Toronto has really become the hotbed of escape rooms right now in North America. And I'm excited about that because on this map, you can actually see Brantford over there on the left towards the bottom. That's where I am. And so I'm about an hour and 15 minutes away from Toronto, and so I'm excited to be close to this. Uh, the study that I put out, one of the things that I did is I created some tables that show differences between different areas of the world. I'm now going to show you, I've picked out a few of those. Some of these are in the study, some of these aren't, um, but they are places where in North America there were some differences between the rest of the world. Now, all of these are based upon averages, so this is cases where on average North America was different than rooms in other places. So first, it's a growing market in North America. So what this table represents is I ask the facilities, do you feel that you're oversaturated or if it's just right or undersaturated? As so you can see, um, in Asia, there was uh, more of a belief that the market's oversaturated, and in Europe, that there was more of a belief that there was an appropriate number of escape rooms. But in North and South America, we've got a number of rooms uh, saying, hey, we're the only one in the area, and that there's room for growth, uh, so much so that there was recently a, a article in Market Watch about the unbelievably lucrative business of escape rooms. Um, so this was a very rosy article about how much money escape room companies can make. It's a growing market right now, especially when compared to other places around the world. And people ask me about the future, and I said, well, just look what's going on in Asia. Look what's going on in Europe. There's going to be a lot, and then they're going to start to collapse a little bit. Now, there were some differences in the way North American rooms run. And the biggest difference that I saw is that North, in North America, they are much more likely to put small groups of people together in an escape room. And this was not something I saw as often in Asia or in Europe, that, uh, that if, in, if you were a group of two or three, that you were likely to be put together with other groups, other small groups, to play a room together. Now, I think this might have a few things to do with the culture of the space. Now, from an escape room facilitator's perspective, this is actually quite good because if you're charging per person to go into that room, the more bodies you can get into that room, the better it is. 
For players, it can be good or it can be frustrating based upon who it is that you get in that room with you. If you were not wanting to play with kids and you end up having a family with kids come into the room, well, that could be a frustrating experience. Some North American facilities actually are advertising themselves as offering private rooms, which is more of the model in other places. Um, some are playing with models where they charge a certain amount for per person in a room, or you can pay another amount and have the room to yourself. You can book the whole room to yourself. Another place where there was a difference is the presence of staff in a room. So what we found is in North American rooms, there were, there were more likely to have someone in the room, either as a, uh, we found about a third of the time there were staff in the room and to make sure things were not being broken, and that's more likely to be monitored with video in other places. So part of this, I think, has to do with it being a young market, that it's easier to just put someone in the room as a game master or someone to give clues or someone to be part of the story than it is to have those things be done via other forms. Uh, so it takes money to mount cameras and all that, but you can actually have someone in the room to help you with what's going on. I think this is something that will change as the market becomes more mature and they realize that the cost to have those staff members in the rooms is high. And so it's better to have some other sort of system or at least more cost effective. Uh, but I think this is just a part of being a new market. Another place that there was a difference is that if the, if, if the room scheduled time to talk to the players after the game. In North America, that's more likely that there will be time built in for the game master to talk to the players about what went on. In fact, 86% uh, of people surveyed from North and South America said they did that as compared to Asia, 40%, Europe, about 65%. Uh, so that model, and again, this may be it's a younger uh, market that they want to get more of that feedback because they're growing, they're trying to figure things out as compared to being more a uh, more mature market where it's get the players in, get them out, you know, send them on their way. Uh, now, where this is interesting is when you get into corporate training models. So one of the things I do is study corporate training, and I know that a number of rooms are actually making quite a bit of money reaching out to corporate and nonprofit training. Um, an issue, though, with that is that you need to provide that kind of space and facilities for debriefing after the activity because a good, doing a good training activity is not just about playing the game, but it's actually having that debriefing afterwards. But that's a whole nother talk. So those are a few of the differences. Again, if you look at my paper, you'll see many more tables broken out with these sorts of things. But these are a few places where I saw some differences in North America compared to the rest of the world. Now I want to highlight a few projects that have gone on in North America that I think are worth looking at. The first one is Five Wits. Now I'm currently working on a case study of Five Wits. Five Wits is a uh, just starting to franchise out. They were originally in the Boston area. They've built a franchise in Syracuse, and now they're going on from there. They were actually started in 2003. So they, and they don't call themselves an escape room, but it's a very similar activity. They, so they have figured out how to make money, and they've been around for over 10 years doing so. So there's some models of what Five Wits is doing that's different than the escape room industry, but that provides some good suggestions to look at when you're thinking about how to be uh, financially successful in the long term. Now their structures are, they have about three rooms per adventure, and it's a 30-minute adventure. They do put small groups together into their rooms. Each of their three rooms, there's a story, a strong narrative, there's some sort of a video introduction, and then a strong narrative. Each room has about two puzzles, but you're very guided as to the puzzles. So you will be offered, now you need to do this thing. Once you accomplish that, now you do this thing. Then you move on to the next room. One of the clever things that they do in Five Wits is they actually have the puzzles that have uh, two different solutions. So when you solve the puzzle for one, then that sets up the puzzle to be solved the other way. Here's a small example of that. You have a room that has a, a long chain running through the bars of a prison, and that at the end there's a key on a ring moving on that chain, and the key is in one of two holes on a lock. And the goal is to take the key, feed it along the chain, in and out of the bars and put it in the other side. So when you've accomplished that, the door opens, you can continue. And more importantly, you've now just set up the puzzle for the next team. They've designed it so none of their puzzles require a human to reset the puzzle. That they all have some sort of A-B state that the puzzle, you solve it in one state and it sets it up for the, the next team. And in fact, that's part of the brilliance here. Because of the way they've got things set up, they can have multiple teams in their facility at one time. So one team is in the first room, another team is queued up, that team moves on, this team moves up, 
another team is queued up, etc. So they can cycle teams through this 30 minute experience because they have required, created puzzles that don't require a human to reset it. And they have a computer program that's monitoring the whole thing to make sure everything is in place. There are staff that are watching what's going on in case there's emergencies, but this allows them to bring the costs down. So on average, escape rooms cost about $25 per person to play. They're able to get their cost down to about $10 per person. If you play multiple rooms, it's actually much cheaper. And part of it is their narrative, their story, their narrative is focused on creating a good experience for the players. It's not about, I am the game designer and I have made the escape room and you must escape my escape room. <laughs> it's not that at all. It's about having a good experience. It's about creating something for someone to come through and feel like they're the hero, feel like they're the center of it. So they're doing some really smart stuff. It's actually designed more like a theme park attraction, which makes sense because the people behind Five Woods have done some work with Disney and they've done work with museums and things like that. And I think this model is an interesting model for us to think about, and that's why I'm writing a case study on this right now, because it's a model on how this escape room concept could be something that's more scalable, could be something that actually can be repeatable. They have technology behind some of their puzzles, and because of the A-B states, they could actually create a space that's repeatable. Um, so they're exploring those concepts right now. Something that I did was I worked with Fort Stanwix National Park. Now, Fort Stanwix is a military fort from the uh, Revolutionary War times in the U.S. And what I did is I created an escape room for them. And the idea behind this is I wanted to make it realistic because this is a national monument, but actually use things that were authentic to the time. So no padlocks, you know, none of that kind of stuff could be involved. I started by looking at the, the story of Fort Stanwix and I found a real story uh, about sabotage that was going on in the fort. And that's the story in the game. The players are placed into a role within a real story. And they realize that. They learn that at the end in the debriefing that what you just experienced actually is based on these real stories and this real fact and these people. All of the puzzles were based upon revolutionary war cryptography methods and other things that made sense for the time. The affordances, which is a term we use in game studies for how you are uh, creating the experience, bringing it to life, how do people interact with your game. All the affordances were authentic. So what this did is this really helped me to explore the concept of this gold standard of escape room design, and I'm writing a piece upon this right now. So you have different levels when you design an escape room. You can start with a series of puzzles and get out of the room. So that's if you have no theme at all, that's sort of level one, you know, do the puzzles, get out of the room, yay. Level two is where you introduce some kind of a theme. It's set in a dungeon, it's set in an asylum, it's set in space. And you try to bring some sort of theme or feeling to all of the puzzles. The next level is to bring about a narrative, to bring about a story, something where the players' roles matter, where it matters that the players are involved and they are in the center of the story. They don't happen to be bystanders who just happen to get locked. You've been happened to be locked in the space and you've got to find your way out. Make the players matter. They're the ones paying for this. Make their experience matter and make the puzzles make sense within that theme and within the narrative and figure out, can you actually help tell the story via the puzzles? Can you use these puzzles to help tell the story? That it's not just, yay, I unlocked the puzzles to get a four-digit code to open a padlock. Well, why is that four-digit code match with that padlock? Why is there black light paint all over the room? Why are these things here? Think about how to make the affordances, the, the ways you are supplying people with the puzzles, fit within the theme and fit within the world. Ask the question, why? And that is my advice on how you can improve your escape rooms, is to ask the question, why? Why are these puzzles here? Why are these things here? How can I make it all make sense? It's an extra design challenge to do that, but when you're done, you can create a much more immersive room. The last thing I want to mention is something that's exciting me quite a bit. As I mentioned earlier, I'm working with ed game, escape rooms and education, as well as in corporate training, and there's a new open source project called Breakout EDU, where you can learn more about it. And they have created a basic open source platform for escape room design, which is a box with stuff in it. And what they're doing is they're trying to get escape room concepts used in the classroom. So the idea is that you can either buy the box from them, or you can get a list of all the stuff to buy, and then teachers are making games for their classes. And you can download these games and print everything out and run the game in your class to teach a concept. So this brings me to the end of my short time period here. If you want to keep up with what I'm doing, I'll point you to visit escapeenthusiasts.com. 
That's a website that's going to list links to other places. You'll find a link to my paper that I've talked about. You'll find a link to a Facebook group that is quite active about escapes. Uh, you'll find a link to a Google group that's a little less active. Um, but that's also where I'm going to post more things as I put them together. If you want to follow me on Twitter, you can visit me at, at S. Nicholson. So with that, I will let you enjoy the rest of your conference. You can now applaud at the screen. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.